Hey everybody, I'm Ben, and welcome to Extreme Basics. In the last video I made, we took a look at HTML and how you can use it to develop websites. Now in this video, we're going to be looking into CSS and how it can extend the functionality of HTML to make our websites look a little bit better. So CSS is a little bit of a weird programming language because there's not very much to it. The only thing that it does is it provides a set of instructions to a web browser for how it should display a specific HTML page. So now let's take a look at what that means. So we're gonna start by going into Sublime and creating a new file. So I'm just going to do control N and then we're going to save that file into a folder that I created on my desktop called CSS tutorial, but you can save it wherever. Just make a folder for it and save it there. And we're going to start by calling it index.html and we're going to save that. So without an HTML page to provide instructions on, CSS doesn't do anything. So we need to create this HTML page and we're going to start by just setting up a simple head and body inside of an HTML tag. So we start with an opening HTML tag, and we see Sublime has this autocomplete feature, so if we just hit enter, it sets up the HTML page for us. Now it has this doc type HTML tag at the top. That's for HTML5, and we haven't gone over that yet, so I'm just going to get rid of it really quick. And this title tag we also don't need. We just want the head and the body. So just to get us back up to speed, inside the body, let's create two h1 tags. And if you watched our previous HTML video, you should know what the h1 tag does. I actually need to close that one. And we're just going to put a little bit of text, like heading one. And we're going to take this and we're going to copy it, let's say, two more times. If we save this, then we can go into our folders. We'll see that there's the index page. And if you select it and right click it, you can open with whichever web browser you want. I already have this web page open, so I'm just going to go over to my Chrome. I'm going to open it up and we see that it's blank. But when I refresh the page, we see that it has the three h1 tags that we put in. Now, this is fine if we just want all of our text to look like this. If we want all of our H1 tags to look exactly the same, like if we're happy with this, then that's fine. But say we want to make the first one red and the second one green and the third one blue, then in that case, using CSS is the best way to go. So I know we still haven't really gone over what CSS is, and I promise we're going to be doing that in a minute. But first, let's take a look at the three ways that we can include CSS in our HTML. So the first way is with a style tag, and we don't actually need the type attribute. So just in between these two style tags is where we would type our CSS for this web page. Um, another place that we can do it is within a tag itself, we can just define a style attribute. And in between these parentheses is where we would put our CSS. The last way we can do it is at the top of the page again, inside the head, we have a link tag. Um, and it creates it for us. The rel attribute has to be set to style sheet. The type attribute has to be set to text slash CSS. And the href attribute is going to be a link to where our external style sheet is. This file doesn't exist yet, but we're just going to call it styles.css. And we're going to save this page. And now what we're going to do is we're going to create, uh, we're going to control N to create a new file. And we're going to save that as styles.css. CSS. So now over here on the left, we can see that we have an index.html and a styles.css. So if we look here, we see there's the three ways to include CSS. We can include it with this link tag and type all of our CSS in here, and it will apply to everything on the page. We can type our CSS code directly in between these style tags inside the head or inside the body, inside a specific tag itself we can just define a style attribute. So let's take a look at the syntax for CSS. It's incredibly straightforward. There's only three things that you repeat over and over and over again inside of CSS. So the first thing is the selector, and that's basically helping us decide which item in our body that we want to select. So the thing that we want to change in this HTML is h1. So we're going to start with an h1 selector. Then next to the h1 selector, we have to set up a declaration block. And inside the declaration block is where we actually provide the set of instructions for what we want the web browser to do to this h1 tag. So the declaration block is just an opening and closing curly bracket. And we can hit enter, and it'll put us inside this new line. So we have our h1 selector and our h1 declaration block. And in the declaration block is where we actually create our declaration. Now, declarations are made up of two items. There's a property and a value. So you say, this is the property I want to change, and you set a value to that property. So say, I want the text color to be red. You say, color is the property, and red is the value. So let's do that really fast. We'll do color, and then the way that you say, instead of an equal sign, we use a colon and then we can just type red. And if we save this and we go back to our 
uh, web page, and then we refresh, we see that it changed the color of all the H1 tags to red. So now back inside of our body, let's look at the style attribute that we put in the first H1. Let's see what happens when we define a color attribute inside of this specific tag itself. So we can create a new color and call it uh, blue, and then we want to end with a semicolon like we, like we do up at the top here. And if we save this, and then we go back to our web page, and then we refresh the web page, we'll see that um, the first one got set to blue, but the two after that got set to red. And that's because the first thing we did in our code was <clears throat> we set them all to red, every H1 tag was set to red, but then this specific H1 tag was redefined, had the color redefined to blue. So now let's finally look at what happens if we take this um, code here, let's just cut it with uh, Control X or Command X, and go over into our styles.css and we'll paste it with Control or Command V. And if we, let's change this just for demonstration purposes to green. And we'll save this and we'll go back to our index.html and make sure we save that. And now we'll go back to our web page and we'll refresh the page and we'll see that everything is set up correctly because the styles are being included from styles.css and it's setting all of them to green and then the first h1 tag is being set to blue inside of the tag itself. So from here on out everything else is incredibly straightforward. So now if we go back into our code just to demonstrate one last time how the hierarchy works between the different uh, ways of including styles, if we create another style here let's select all the h1s again and create another declaration block and create another color declaration color uh, and we'll set it back to red and we'll save this and we'll go back into our web page and if we refresh this page we see that it'll change them all back to red even though in our code we're still including uh, the style sheet and in the style sheet everything all of the h1 tags are still set to green so this is happening because of the order in which the web browser is interpreting the code so it reads all of the code in sty inside of styles.css first and says okay i'll set them all to i'll set all of the h1 tags to green and then it reads the code directly below it and then we say okay actually set them all to red and then it reads the code in the body and it says actually set this h1 tag to blue so it sets them to green and then it resets all of them to red and then it just sets this one to blue but these ones are still red because we we haven't changed their color since the last time that it that it decided what they should be. But it's best practice to only use external style sheets. So what we'll do is we'll get rid of this and we will get rid of this and we just have our external style sheet linking to our web page now. So now we know all of these will be green. Uh, we don't need to refresh the page to take a look at that. We'll just save it and we're gonna move on to the next concept. The next thing we're gonna be taking a look at are actually HTML tags that we haven't covered before because we haven't really had any need for them. So those HTML tags are span, and it takes a closing span, and div, which takes a closing div. So what do the span and div tags do on their own? So well, let's just type some text in between them and see what they do. Uh, this is some text in a span, and this is some text in a div. And we'll save this, and we'll go back to our web page. If we refresh the page, we see that nothing very fancy happens. So what's the point of the span on the div tag? Well, the span tag is basically a way of creating a tag around some text that we can apply some attributes to that doesn't have any attributes on its own. So we could do this. We could do style, like we said before, and give it a color uh, of red and save that. And then if we go back to our web page and refresh it, we'll see it made the text red. And that's all it did. But a better thing to do inside of a span is to give it a class attribute. Now class attributes are different than all the attributes that we've looked at before, like relative has to be defined as style sheet, and href has to be a link to a different file, whether it be a local or an external file. But a class attribute can be whatever you want, so you can define it as anything that you want. So let's just say um, red text. And this is just descriptive for us. If we, if we just save this and we go back to our web browser, the web browser doesn't know what that class is. We haven't told it that this class means anything yet. So when we refresh the page, it just sets it back to the default. So how do we give this class red text some meaning? Well, we can do it inside of our styles.css. In this instance, red text is basically gonna be our selector. The way you select a class is with a period um, and then red 
text is the name of the class that we're selecting. And then we make a de declaration block and we can set the color here uh, to red. And if we save this and we go back to our uh, web page and we refresh it, we'll see that it changed the text to red. Because in our CSS, we first selected all of our tags with the class red text and then we set the color attribute to red. So now we can reuse this class wherever we want because we've defined the red text class as just setting the text to red. So we can make a class up here, class, and set it to red text again and save it and go back to our code. And we'll see that it sets the text of the second heading tag uh, to red as well. So the reason we would do this is say that we wanted to have a bunch of different pieces of our text be bold and italicized and underlined, we could do that by putting a B and an I and a U tag around every piece of text that we want to be bold and italicized and underlined, or we could just put a span around them, give it a class and call it whatever we want, and then just define that class in our CSS with the bold and the underlined and the italicized attributes. It's a way of just simplifying your code so that you're not having to type a bunch of tags over and over and over again. Okay, so now how does the div differentiate itself from the span tag? Well, if we think of our web page like, say, a Word document, then everything inside of the body is just gonna be like if you were to type text on the page. You can format it, like you can center it, and you can uh, make it bold and make it underlined. A div tag is kind of like a text box where you can put text inside of the div. You can actually put images or whatever you want inside of the div, but then you can more easily like move it around and format it and like reshape it and stuff in exactly the position that you want. So let's give this div tag a class attribute and call it um, like example div. Uh, and we'll save that and we'll go into our style.css and we'll select example div and we'll div give it a declaration and now we'll start looking at some of the other attributes that can be defined inside of CSS. Now we can give this div, uh, let's say a background color. We'll give it a background color of light blue and if we save that and we go back to our web page and we refresh it, we'll see that the div has a background color of light blue. Now if we look at our web page, we'll see that the whole that the div stretches 100% from the left of the page to the right of the page. But inside of CSS, say I wanted to have a div that's only like 50% of the width. So I have like a whole block of text. So let's go back to our code and we'll go back into our index.html and we'll copy some of the text inside of the div and just uh, paste it a bunch more times. So now, I mean, we can imagine what that's gonna do. If we go back to our web page and we refresh it, it's just gonna put a bunch of text inside of the div. But now we can resize the div and the text inside will resize with it. So let's go back to our code. Inside of our styles.css, we'll set a width attribute for this div. Um, and we'll set it to, let's say 50%. And you have to end that line with a semicolon. And let's save that. And if we go back to our web page and we refresh it, we'll see that the div becomes 50%. And all of the text inside of it just resizes to go back onto the line. Now if we want, we can go back into our code and we can also set uh, we could also set a height attribute and let's say you can also use pixels So we'll say like 200 pixels and we'll save that and if we go back into our web page We refresh it. We'll see that it just adds some height to the div So now we see that we have a div that has some text in it and it's uh, 200 pixels tall and it's 50% of the view width So if we were to resize the page uh, the div would resize with it and the text inside would just move on to different lines So now if we go back to our code and we go back into our styles.css, we can set a few more attributes just to take a look at uh, what some of our different options for attributes are. If we wanna have some padding between like the edge of the div and where the text is, because say we have a background color and we don't want it to be so close to the edge, we can go into our code and we can set a padding. And we can set that to, let's say 10 pixels. And if we save that and we go back to our code, let's see what that does when we refresh. We see it just moves the text down and over just away from the edge by 10 pixels. So that's really straightforward. And what that ended up doing was it just resized to accommodate for that padding. Another thing that we can do is create a margin around the div. Uh, so let's do a margin and we'll do that for 10 pixels as well. And we'll save that and go back to our web page and refresh it. And we'll see that it just puts a uh, margin around it. So it moves it 10 pixels away from the edge and 10 pixels 
away from the uh, thing above it or the thing to the right or the thing below it. Now let's say with the div, instead of being to the left of the screen, we want it to be to the right. So we can do that with another cool attribute called float. And we can set the float to the side of the screen basically that we want it on. So if we set it to float right and we save that, we go back to our web page and we refresh the page, we'll see that the div floats over to the right. One side effect that this has is it'll move it up to the line above it. So now we see that this is this is some text in a span. It's basically almost on the same line as the div. It's just 10 pixels down because it has a top margin of 10. So the fact that this happens may be beneficial to us in the case where we would want to have like two, two or more columns on the web page. So we would have like a div on the left and a div on the right and one would have some text or some pictures and another one would have uh, some different text or some pictures and they would just be side by side instead of stacking everything on top of each other. So the way that we do this is actually pretty straightforward. Let's go back to our code. We can copy this whole div uh, with just control C and then we can control V twice uh, just to put them back in place. So now we have two divs and in order to prevent them from, from including anything on the same line above them, we're just gonna wrap this in a new div that's just gonna be empty. It's not gonna have anything around it, but it's just gonna kind of group these two divs together. Oh, the autocomplete got me there. Um, and if we change this one, let's say we declare this one as example div two, and we save this, and now we have to go define what example div two is in our CSS. So we'll make a new selector for uh, example div two, and now we need to make a declaration block for example div two, and with this one, we're gonna float it to the left. Uh, float left. And now we want to define a height. Um, let's do a height of 200 pixels again. And we'll do a width of, um, because we have a margin on this, let's just set this one to 45% so that they don't kind of overflow and push each other off of the, um, off of the line. And then we just want to set a background color so we can see what we're, lo what we're looking at. Um, so let's just set a background color and set it to red, let's say. And we can save this, and we can go back to our web page, and we can refresh this, and we'll see that it puts these two divs on the, uh, like right next to each other. The reason this one is a little bit lower is because we set a uh, margin around it, and we wanted them to be kind of in the same place, then we would go back to our code, and we would either get rid of the margin here, or add a margin in here. So that's pretty much it for CSS. There are obviously some more advanced things that we didn't get into, but CSS in the end is really just about selecting the objects that you wanna change, understanding which things you can change about them, and then knowing what values you can set those things to. So there's not really much more that you can learn other than just going through and seeing what all of the different possible attributes are for all of the different items in HTML. So I've linked to a really good resource down in the description with a bunch of different attributes for CSS that you can go check out in your free time if you want. And you basically just have to reuse the principles that you learned in this tutorial to make your web page look however you want it to. So thank you so much for watching this CSS tutorial. If you wanna watch the HTML tutorial that I made, you can click that box over there. And if you're watching this a few weeks after this video came out, I'll be making an HTML5 tutorial, which will be linked to below it. I also have some other helpful links in the description, so go check them out. And if you like this video, be sure to give it a like. And let me know down in the comments if you're having some trouble with anything, because I will be around and I'll be answering as many questions as I can. So thank you again so much for watching, and I will see you all in the next one. Bye!